part one, the journey to acceptance. All manner of things shall be well by the purification of the motive and the ground of our beseeching. T.S. Eliot. Chapter one, the way it was. This is the use of memory for liberation, not less of love, but expanding of love beyond desire. And so liberation from the future as well as the past. T.S. Eliot. I look forward to the day when we can share our love through common consciousness and when all the messages which the master has given to humanity are so well known that none require a preface. Until that time, however, the reality of context is inescapable. Many of you will surely ask, who is this woman who has spoken to Jesus and how did it happen? The conversations presented in this book are more important by far than the nature of their occurrence, and yet, for the sake of clarity and history, they are inseparable from the process. The special quality of his truth is that there is a sacred residence and harmony within it which clarifies, integrates, and focuses the truth of all men. His presence is recognizable without introduction. Mine, however, is not. By profession, I am an artist. And by grace, I am a woman whose greatest truth was found in the master's presence. Nevertheless, this book is not about religion, and I am not a theologian. Were it not for events which were nothing short of sacred phenomena, I would in no way be equipped to deliver this mes these messages to you, nor would I possess the wellspring of substance which you are about to receive. These messages were not derived from reading, research, religious preparation, or human mentors. The tapestry of this missive and the loom which wove it were my experience of painting the master's portrait. The originator of this dialogue was the master himself, and I was the participant. Therefore, certain aspects of my story are relevant to the reader's larger understanding. This is not because I have any special importance, for certainly I am one with the rest of humanity. The purpose in telling you about myself is to build immunity for you against subtle intrusions of my character upon your own viewpoint. Thus, I may become translucent or even invisible to the master's message. It is also my fervent hope to share with you a precious miracle, an insertion of divinity into the predictable order of life. By presenting the picture of an ordinary person in fellowship with His Holiness, perhaps I can give you a reference point of comfort from which to receive a similar communion. In a presence as real as life, but manifested from realms divine, Jesus appeared to me and was with me for almost four months between November 1991 and March 1992. During this time we spoke, as friends do, of matters large and small. Our conversations were not about idealistic worlds or visions of things to come. His messages were about life as we live it, and the potential for heaven that lies within each of us now. His words are immensely practical, universally timeless, and refreshingly relevant to our most advanced level of knowledge. There is a clarity in them which needs no extra support or explanation. Therefore, if moved to do so, you may go directly to his messages in part two and begin. To assist the reader's study, I have presented the master's words in italics. That way, they may be isolated from the dialogue and savored independently. At the same time, I have made every effort to remember and to reconstruct 
the anecdotal aspects of his visitation, revealing the queries, motives, and emotions which I brought to the situation. The friendly nature of our exchange was always directed to things that were of mutual interest or relevant to our relationship. Our topics of conversation ranged from the practical to the miraculous, with pleasant interludes of chit-chat. Every day that we spoke, I took voluminous notes, sometimes during the conversation, but most often in the evening when I was alone. My sole intent in taking notes was to preserve the wisdom presented for my own future reference. During the process of transcription, it never occurred to me that I would ever share my conversations publicly, and most certainly, I did not proceed with academic diligence to cover all aspects of theological concern. This was a deeply personal experience, yet it was also external to myself. Not only was there a sacred presence before me, visible to my eyes, but also there was a beautiful voice, and I responded to it with my own. The words you are about to read are not the result of automatic writing or channeling. We are all channels for God. Nevertheless, the practice of channeling as an intentional process was not used. Channeling as a way of directing communication from other realms into this one, is a very ancient practice currently revived in its popularity. My reason for mentioning it, however, is neither to commend nor to disparage, merely to distinguish. The words Jesus spoke to me were audible, and I responded in full consciousness. As for existential explanations of it all, my perspective is not yet grand enough to encompass the many possibilities. What happened between November 23, 1991 and March 12, 1992 was nothing short of miraculous. However, it is not necessary that it be explained or regarded in any particular way. I simply hope that the reader will receive the story about to be told as the enlightenment of a woman who found her place within the master's truth. Regardless of whether you call him friend, teacher, master, lord, or god incarnate, it still remains a historical fact that no single individual has had more influence upon the course of human events in the last 2,000 years. Regardless of one's beliefs or even disbelief, his impact belongs to us all. Well beyond the countless numbers who center their religious convictions around him, there are other millions who behold his influence, wisdom, love, and virtue, despite their disinterest in their religions built in his name. This is a reality which exceeds the varieties of private or collective faith. In respect of that reality, while honoring the sacred aspects as well, I have chosen to refer to him as either the master or simply Jesus. While some readers might prefer more sacred protocol, I feel that the term master is suitably honorable without establishing a religious viewpoint which might exclude others from the study of these messages. What you get from the messages is a direct result of what you hear. Basic to all of Jesus' teaching to me was that of innocent perception. Open your eyes that you may see and your ears that you may hear, for there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that it should not come to light. In the end, we will all draw conclusions about what we have heard. Yet little will be seen or heard if we enter the listening without an openness to receive or without a yearning heart.